Let's continue with the proof of Stokes' theorem. This is the, there's a couple of really cool parts to Stokes' theorem. We've seen one of them, which is that proving it for the unit cube is really easy and just amounts to the fundamental theorem plus a bunch of extra variables so it don't do anything. Uh, but now let's look at number three here. Take a look and read that, pause and read it if you want. Um, we really want to have a situation where we have Rn and then we have some subset inside there. So I'm going to draw it as this two-dimensional surface in R3, but it's going to be completely general. And I want, and I have a form, alpha, that lives in Rn, and it's going to be a k minus 1 dimension, or a k minus 1 form. The degree is k minus 1. And then this guy is k dimensional. And so that makes it possible to integrate over, and this is called m, to integrate over m d of alpha. And I, the claim is going to be that that's the integral over the boundary of m, which is then going to be k minus 1 dimensional of alpha. OK. So the case we're going to do, it's not going to be the absolutely completely general case. But typically, what we have for one of these uh, sets m is it's parameterized. Let's call the parameter map phi. And it's coming from some domain in, well, if this is k-dimensional, it's going to be some domain in rk. And I'm going to do the special case where that parameter domain is just the unit square. In general, it's going to be ik is the domain. And so phi is going to be a map from ik to uh, rn. And its image is going to be m. So you might think that's still pretty special, and we're going to address that in the next two problems. But it's really not very special, um, because parameterizations are so flexible that uh, we can often take a fairly complicated surface in R3, for example, and parameterize it with exactly this domain. And we're going to see that really, almost always, we can, we can, uh, we can really do that. And there's some other, there's some other uh, easy techniques to make this more general. But this really gets us to almost the full level, level of generality for Stokes' theorem. Okay. So we want to know if this is true. And there's three pieces to Stokes' theorem. There's the integral. There's the d, the exterior derivative, and there's the boundary. Well, let's deal with the boundary first, OK? Well, the boundary, if m is phi of i, k, then the boundary of m, OK, that's this boundary stuff here, it's pretty plausible that that's just exactly the boundary, that that's phi, the image under phi of the boundary of i, k. And in fact, if you're worried, is that rigorous or not? Well, we haven't actually been rigorous, very rigorous yet about the boundary of a k-dimensional object in Rn. We can really kind of make this a definition that we can say we, we have a good grasp of what the boundary of the unit cube is. Let's just make this a definition. Now, phi has to be a fairly nice map, but we wouldn't be using this unless phi is differentiable fairly, and has some fairly nice properties. Um, and so it's not going to do some weird, twisty thing that's going to confuse this. So that's something we're just going to go ahead and say that either it's, it's a, an assumption or we can even say, almost say it's a definition of what that boundary is. Okay. Um, so that's going to be, that says that phi respects the idea of boundaries. Okay. Now, what about integrals? Well, actually, you know, what is the integral over this weird subset of alpha? How did we define that? We defined it using the pullback by phi. And that takes it back to ik. OK. So that's nice. Once again, essentially by definition, the integral respects, uh, or the, the, um, the pullback respects that integral, because the integral is actually defined in terms of the pullback. OK. Let me just, I want to keep my pictures here, but let's just continue the chain of reasoning here. OK. So uh, pullback and Boundaries play well together, check. Pullback and integrals play well together, check. Pullback and d, well, absolutely. Pullback of d of alpha, that also, that was one of these naturality properties that we were using a lot when we were doing some explicit integrals. Um, oh, whoa, so many parts of this video ago. So pullback and d play well together as well. And from that, 
<clears throat> it's going to be really easy. Let me just uh, scoot it up here. It just We're just going to say that the integral over m of alpha is going to be equal to the integral over ik of the pullback. Oh, that's terrible. Pullback through phi of alpha, which is <clears throat> uh, now I can use Stokes' theorem because I'm on my model case. That's integral oh, of d, uh, shoot, d alpha. There we go. There's a d there. That's the integral of, whoop, I could use the Stokes' theorem, except that's not a d of something. Just getting confused about the order of things here. Now I can use the naturality of d. And now I've got the integral over my model case of d of something. That's the integral over the boundary of ik of the pullback of alpha. But that's exactly what I would get. Let me give, give some room here. If I wanted to integrate over uh, the boundary of m of alpha, I would pull back alpha to the um, to the appropriate set, and pulling back phi, the the boundary of m, all the stuff that I want to do here, just pulls back to the boundary here. That's for using this, and there we go. That's it. So <clears throat> this is the other really cool thing that we get from all this technology of forms is that once we prove this theorem on the model case, then it all just absolutely falls out from the naturality of all these operations. Integral, d, and boundary are all things that work exactly the same way in all places. And when I use a translation, like this parameterization phi, to translate from one to the other, nothing changes. And so even though this looks much more complicated, absolutely nothing changes, and the proof for the model case shows that it's true in general. So Take a look at four and pause for a second. We've really this is this is really a great place to be because we've used some of the very essential properties of forms, some of the algebra and calculus, and especially the naturality properties to prove Stokes' theorem. But uh, there was this concern as to whether this case, where the domain d was just i k, was kind of special. After all, there's various cases where uh, there's natural domain might be like a disk. We've often had that kind of parameterization. Okay. Well, there's a couple of easy things we can do to accommodate that. And in number four is one of them. Suppose we actually had something where here's a set, a, a part of our thing, maybe in R3, that has a nice parameterization by a rectangle just gets wiggly and, and, and bouncy, but then maybe it has like a, it's like a wiggly cube or something. Has some other piece, and maybe there's kind of a sharp uh, edge, kind of a bend there, just like you'd have in a cube. Uh, there's probably not a nice, nice differentiable function that kind of takes this and parameterizes the, all of it together. And maybe it's a whole wiggly kind of cube. And after all, if we can't do wiggly cubes, this thing is not working very well. Okay, well. The key is that that's just a bunch of pieces. If this whole thing is m, then m, in that case, would be m1 union m2 union m3. And we'd like to know, is it true that the integral of m over m of d alpha, the whole thing, is the integral of the boundary of alpha? Is that still true, even though m isn't just the image of one single unit cube? Well. Let's just look at how this works on the unions, OK? So the integral over m, that's just going to be the integral over m1 of d alpha plus the integral over m2 of d alpha plus the integral over m3 of d alpha. On each of those, Stokes' theorem is going to work. So that's going to be the integral over boundary m1 of alpha plus the integral over boundary m2 of alpha. Let's see if I can squeeze it in. Integral boundary m3 of alpha. And then what's going to happen there? OK, so that's the sum of all the results from all these boundaries. We'd like to say that that's the integral over just the boundary of the whole thing. Well, here's one of those great things about how boundaries work. This piece has a boundary like here and a boundary here. But this piece, if it's oriented correctly, is going to have the same boundary going in the opposite direction. Let me say that in my color. So this guy is going to have a boundary going like this. This guy is going to have a boundary going like that. 
and the boundaries are going to cancel out. Similarly, this guy is going to have a boundary going like this, and the boundaries are going to cancel out. If these guys really are consistently oriented, so as I move from here to here, the swirl doesn't change, then necessarily the boundary arrow induced by that squirrel, they're, <laughs> swirl, not squirrel, they're going to cancel out. And so this has contributions from whatever honest to God boundaries we get that aren't canceled out. And this has contributions, and this has contributions from the honest pieces of the boundary. And they all also have contributions from the internal boundaries, but those cancel out exactly. And so this does end up being the integral over the boundary of alpha. And so this is another fundamental thing about how this theorem works, um, that this is something that you should be able to break into pieces and add the pieces back up. That's the basic thing about an integral. But that's how boundaries work as well. The boundary of a union is the union of the boundaries because all the interior ones cancel out. So that gets us uh, a bit more general kind of thing where we can have a bunch of pieces. And if we can uh, cut, together, cut up our surface into a bunch of pieces, each of them parameterized by a cube, then we're fine. Then the last problem in this set, let me show you number five, is an example. I didn't want to go too general on this, but it's an example of how we could actually even direct, directly talk about using another parameter domain as well. And it just really comes from the naturality, but I'll save that for another video.